Good morning, everybody, and thank you for joining us for our final installment of the Cape Perpetua speaker series for the season. Today, we'll be hearing from Kristen Dawn on a deeper understanding of Oregon's marine reserves. And I'd like to acknowledge the Cape Perpetua area landscape from Yahats to Florence is the traditional territory of the Siletz tribe and Ku's Lower Umpqua and Sayuslaw tribe and acknowledge the tribal governments and their roles historically and today in taking care of these lands. And you can find out more about each of these tribes on their respective websites. A little bit about the Cape Perpetual Collaborative. My name is Tara Dubois. I'm the communications coordinator for the collaborative. And the vision is to foster conservation and collaboration within local communities for scientific exchange management, awareness, and stewardship from the land to the sea in and around the Cape Perpetual Marine Reserve. And the three guiding principles are community engagement, leveraging resources, and engaging in partnerships. And you can see at the bottom here, we have a variety of um, logos. These are our founding partners who came together uh, to form the collaborative in 2017. But I also like to acknowledge that we have several other partners that are local businesses, local government, volunteers, and without all of our partners, we couldn't make this work possible. So thank you. Um, just real briefly, a bit about the Marine Reserve, since uh, we that is our collaborative focus, but fortunately we have Kristen here today to teach us even more. Um, Cape Perpetual Marine Reserve is the largest of five in Oregon and with uh, marine protected areas to the north and south, um, there's some form of protect protected waters that stretch from Yahats to Florence. We also host a variety of community science projects uh, within the Cape Perpetua area, you, as you can see here. Uh, many of them are seasonal, but we do host uh, and, uh, monthly beach cleanups. And you can always join in our Cape Perpetual BioBlitz series using iNaturalist year round um, and take any observations you can from land to sea and that will help us document biodiversity. And in addition to this speaker series, we do host a Young Scientist webinar series. Um, and our last one is coming up on the second Tuesday of April. Um, and you can find out more about all of our events and our speakers um, at our website at kperpetualcollaborative.org. I always like to encourage folks to join, uh, connect with us on our Facebook and our YouTube. And if you like the work that we're doing, uh, you can donate. There's a donate button on our website. And if you just click that button, it'll take it to the steps. And with that, today I'd like to introduce our speaker, Kristen Dawn, who leads the Marine Reserves Program at Oregon Department of Fish and Wildlife. She and her team are responsible for the management and scientific monitoring of Oregon's five marine reserve sites. Over the past 18 years, she's worked on a variety of ocean policy and management topics, including alternative ocean energy, near shore fisheries, and marine reserves and protected areas. Kristen has worked on the planning and implementation of Oregon's marine reserves since 2007. She has a bachelor's degree in marine biology from UC Santa Cruz and a master's degree in marine and environmental affairs from the University of Washington. And you might find her surfing along the Oregon coast or curled up with a good fiction novel. And with that, Kristen, I will stop share and you can bring up your screen. Um, and as Kristen brings up her presentation, I just want to let folks know you are welcome to uh, put in your questions into the chat or the Q&A box um, as they come up for you. And after Kristen's presentation, we will do a Q&A session. All right. Tara, just want to confirm, can you hear me and can you see my slides? Yes, it looks great. OK, excellent. Well, good morning, everyone. Um, thank you for the introduction, Tara. So again, my name is Kristen Dawn. I'm the Marine Reserves Program Leader at the Oregon Department of Fish and Wildlife. Uh, I and my other cohorts on my team, there's a total of six of us, are responsible for the management and scientific monitoring of Oregon's five marine reserve sites. And today, um, my presentation is about 40 minutes, give or take. Um, but I'll be sharing with you just an overview of Oregon's marine reserve sites, the what are they, why do we have them, where are they, um, and then we'll dive in a little bit to the ecological monitoring that our 
staff and our research partners are engaged in at the marine reserve sites and i'll tease you with a few discoveries and contributions from our monitoring over the last 10 years and then we'll talk about how we're studying the human dimensions of marine reserves implementation so this is research that our staff and our research collaborators are engaged in to understand how people and communities are affected by marine resource implementation. And then we'll take a deeper dive into the Cape Perpetua Marine Reserve site, learn about what's unique about the site and share some highlights um, from our research about what makes the site unique. And then we'll conclude with sharing where you guys can find more information about the research or activities and our partners, um, where you can find that information um, online or um, elsewhere. So with that in mind, we'll dig in. So the state of Oregon has designated five marine reserve sites off the Oregon coast. So these are areas in the ocean that have been reserved for conservation and scientific research. These sites were over 10 years in the making and involved local communities working with state decision makers to site these reserves in areas that would provide ecological benefits, but also minimize social and econ economic impacts to ocean users and coastal communities. So Oregon created these marine resource sites in order to conserve marine habitats and biodiversity. They are also to serve as scientific reference sites for us to study and learn about marine reserve protections as well as learn more about Oregon's near shore ocean environment. And what we're learning from researching these areas needs to be used to support near shore ocean management here in Oregon. And then the sites are also being implemented so as to avoid significant adverse impacts to ocean users and coastal communities. So marine reserves and protected areas have been created around the world for various purposes, but these are the specific goals for why Oregon created our five marine reserve sites. Now, all five of these sites are located within Oregon's state waters, which means they're all between shore and three nautical, nautical miles offshore. This zone of the ocean is often referred to as the near shore ocean or the near shore ecosystem. It's a pretty unique place in the ocean. Uh, it's a very high energy, high dynamic environment, right? This is where waves are coming to shore and finally breaking. Um, it's where a lot of our upwelling in the summers happen. This is where Northwest wind comes, brings up all this nutrient rich bottom water, which makes these waters highly productive. Um, great place for fish and algae and other seaweeds to grow. Um, and it's where all our seaweeds and kelp grow, right? Because further offshore, it's too deep and dark for seaweeds to grow. So this zone of the ocean is where you find kelp and other seaweeds. Um, so here's a map of all five sites. You'll see they're scattered up and down the coast. And you'll notice that each of the sites has this area in red. And that's the core of the site. and that's the actual marine reserve portion of each site. And in the marine reserve portion of each site, there's no extractive activities allowed. So this means that there's no ocean development and no fishing. So no commercial or recreational fishing allowed in these areas. But then you'll also notice that most of the sites also have one or more uh, marine protected area, these areas in blue surrounding the marine reserve. And in the marine protected areas, there's still no ocean development, but each marine protected area allows some type or level of fishing. And what specific type of fishing is allowed or prohibited is very specific to each marine protected area. You might hear me use the acronym MPA and that stands for marine protected area. So that's just my abbreviation. Okay, so. Oregon Department of Fish and Wildlife is the lead entity responsible for the management and scientific monitoring of these five sites. And we share management responsibilities with three other state agencies. 
So they include state parks and Department of State lands help with management. And then Oregon State Police carries out all enforcement of the rules and regulations of the marine reserve sites. And then we're extremely fortunate to work with a lot of different partners who help us with research, they help us with outreach, they lead community engagement projects. So for example, uh, the Cape Perpetual Collaborative is one of our major partners. They're instrumental in doing a lot of communications and outreach, such as the speaker series today. They've led some of their own research projects and they do a lot of um, citizen science and other ways to engage local businesses and community members. So we really rely on partners to help us implement these marine reserve sites. All right, so we'll dig in a little bit to the ecological monitoring that ODFW, our agency, and uh, our research partners engaged in. And we have created a long-term monitoring program that's able to track and understand ocean changes that are occurring in Oregon's nearshore waters over time. So we're looking at all aspects of the ecosystem um, as part of our long-term monitoring. So that means we're collecting data and information on fish, on shellfish and other invertebrates. We're collecting information on kelp and other seaweeds. We're looking at habitats and we're collecting information on oceanographic conditions. We started sampling at each of the marine reserve sites two years before the harvest restrictions took effect. And then we're continuing to monitor at each site um, on a regular basis. And we, we do our studies both inside the marine reserve and then outside of the marine reserve in what we call comparison areas, which are areas with a lot of similar characteristics such as similar habitats and similar species, um, but the areas are still open to fishing. And so the idea is we study inside the reserve and outside the reserve, and we're looking at what changes are occurring inside the reserve and outside of the reserve over time. And so our team is actually sampling and conducting these surveys at 14 sites up and down the site because we're we're doing surveys in the five marine reserve sites and then outside at nine comparison areas. Um, so this is the first long-term ecosystem focused nearshore monitoring program within state waters. Um, this is the first kind of wide scale with multiple sampling sites. And look, again, looking at very multiple aspects of the marine ecosystem. So this is a really, big deal um, to have this program up and running over the last 10 years. Now our team is focused on four core, what we call core sampling tools. And so they include hook and line surveys, which is which helps us collect information on fish species. And we're really focused on fish that are affiliated with rocky reef habitats in our hook and line surveys. We also work with Oregon State University and the Oregon Coast Aquarium to conduct scuba surveys. These allow us, um, so we're doing these again on rocky reef um, habitat areas in the reserves and comparison areas. They occur in shall more shallow waters of the, the reserves and comparison areas and allow, they allow us to collect data on fish, invertebrates, seaweeds, and habitats. And then we have a video lander. So this is a drop camera system. This is a picture of it here on the right. You see it's got three GoPro cameras attached to it. Um, we can use this in shallow or deep uh, near shore waters. And we use it to collect data on habitats, fish, and invertebrates. And basically what we do is we take our boat with our video lander, we drop down the camera, it sits there on the bottom of the ocean, we're collecting eight minutes of video, we haul the camera back up onto the boat, we move the boat over to the next sampling station, lower the camera back down, collect eight minutes of video, repeat. So it's a very simple um, camera system. Um, and actually it collects some great video footage for a lot of our outreach work as well. So it does double duty. 
And then the fourth tool that our team is really focused on for our monitoring is a remotely operated vehicle, ROV. So again, this has two cameras attached to it. We use this in deeper habitats, deeper waters of the reserves and comparison areas. We can use it both in rocky reef habitat areas and sandy soft bottom habitat areas. And it's great at collecting information on fish, invertebrates, habitats, as well as uh, seaweed coverage. So in addition to the four surveys that our team leads, we have several long-term monitoring collaborations with academic partners. So these include some juvenile fish surveys that are led by Oregon State University. There's rocky intertidal monitoring that's led by UC Santa Cruz researchers. And then there's oceanographic research that's being led by Oregon State University. All right, so now I'll tease you with some of our discoveries and contributions from our monitoring um, from the last 10 years of, of research and monitoring at the Marine Reserves and Comparison Areas. So probably as no surprise, in addition to the research that ODFW and our long-term collaborators are doing, Oregon's marine resource sites are also attracting additional research by researchers, both here in Oregon and elsewhere, um, from universities elsewhere around um, the United States coming to study the reserves. So for example, there was a LINCUT study led by the University of Oregon, um, and actually has resulted recently in a peer-reviewed pu journal publication, a scientific publication. Um, so we helped collect LINCOD for that study. Um, so again, just these, re these reserves serve as great uh, living laboratories for us to learn more about Oregon's near shore ocean and the marine environment. We've discovered several new species of seaweeds through our monitoring. This includes documentation for the first time in Oregon of several species that had been recorded in California and Washington, but had never been observed and recorded here in Oregon. Um, and actually one brand new species that had never been seen before. Uh, the data we're collecting in our monitoring is also being used to support other nearshore ocean management decisions. So for example, we've been able to provide some of our monitoring data to help improve fisheries stock assessments. So for example, we provided data to help with the 2019 assessment for Cabazon. And from these stock assessments are set the fisheries quotas. So we know how much fish can be harvested sustainably in Oregon's state waters and in federal waters. And so we provided data from our juvenile fish surveys and from our hook and line surveys that we provided to the stock assessors to help them get a better handle on what the population levels of Cabazon are to be able to set harvest um, quotas to be able to fish for this species sustainably. So we were able, we were provided the only Oregon data for this stock assessment. All the other data came from other states and we are the only program actually collecting data on juvenile fish currently. We're also helping inform emerging ocean issues that Oregonians care about. So for example, uh, Dr. Susan Branner out of Oregon State University has been leading um, a project to study microplastics and rockfish species off the Oregon coast. During our hook and line surveys in our comparison areas, we kept some of the black rockfish species um, and other rockfish species to hand to Susan and her graduate students for analysis. And in, our, in their studies, they found that 12% of the rockfish that, fish that were collected in the comparison areas had microplastics in their stomachs. So this is, um, uh, a, a research paper has just been sent in for review. So hopefully this will result in a peer review public journal publication here in the very near future. Another example of how our monitoring data is being used to support understanding of emerging ocean issues in Oregon 
is the recovery from sea star wasting disease. Uh, many of you have probably heard that um, in 2013 and 14, a, a disease hit the entire west coast um, of North America affecting sea stars. It affected sea stars down from Baja all the way up to Alaska and had some pretty devastating effects um, in cer certain areas on sea star species. So we have um, some of the data that we've been collecting in our scuba surveys was actually provided to the IUCN that led to the listing of the sunflower star, also known as Pycnopodia, as um, a red listed, so a species that is a very high concern of becoming endangered. We have not seen sunflower stars since sea star wasting disease has occurred in 2014. There have been no sightings of sunflower stars. So this is a really big deal. And some of the data we are now providing actually um, to the federal government for consideration of listing sunflower stars as endangered under the Endangered Species Act. So we are in the process of providing that data um, to the federal government right now. Uh, we've also, through our ROV surveys, have been able to see that certain species have responded differently to recovery from sea star wasting disease. Some species have rebounded, no problem. Others have actually increased since before the disease. And then some, such as the sunflower, have, have been really, uh, have not recovered from, from uh, this outbreak. And so from our ROV surveys, we've been able to document how different species responded. Uh, we currently have a peer review journal publication in review um, highlighting what we've seen here in Oregon with regards to recovery from sea star wasting disease of different species. We've also created a dashboard. It's a website where people can explore um, data from our monitoring. So if you're interested in that, um, you can get to the dashboard from our main website, which I'll share with you in a little bit. Um, but it's a great way to, to, again, get to know the sites a little bit better, see um, what the data have shown over the last 10 years, and to explore the different sites. All right, so I wanted to share with you a little bit about how we're studying the human dimensions of the marine reserve sites also. So this is social and economic research that's helping examine the economics, social and cultural dynamics of marine reserves and the coast. So you people may or may not be familiar with the term human dimensions, uh, but in the research world, human dimensions is re studying the, how people and communities um, value, use, depend on, and relate to natural resources. So in this instance, how do people use, utilize, depend on, value ocean resources, right? Marine natural resources. And in our studies, you know, we're looking at how the marine reserves have impacted people and communities. Right, when you implement a new management uh, or policy measure, such as a marine reserve site, you might have positive benefits, right? The marine reserves potentially could help increase tourism and bring in additional tourism dollars to communities. They might have negative impacts, right? There might be a loss of income to fishermen, fishers, there could be um, a growing mistrust and contention of government agencies, right? Those are some negative impacts. Um, or there could be neutral impacts, right? There might be, we might see no impacts or changes over time. So we want to understand the variety of different social and economic impacts and effects to people and communities because of the marine resource implementation. And we do this, um, we've done, conducted over 15 human dimensions research studies, and we work with academic researchers and consultants in the private sector to help us with this research. And we use a variety of social science methods. So we use economics, we use sociology, we use anthropology, 
and political science to study to understand how people and communities are being affected from marine reserves implementation. So our research questions, we want to know, are people knowledgeable of the marine reserves? Do they even know they exist? Um, we want to know what are the public's attitudes about the marine reserve sites and of management. We want to know what are the economic impacts on fishermen. We want to know what the other significant significant economic impacts are on local coastal communities. And we also not want to know what the social impacts are. And we want to know, do these change over time? And are these long-term impacts different from initial impacts of marine resource implementation? So in addition to these core research questions, we have some broader research questions that are also helping us better understand um, social relationships around uh, natural resource issues. And the idea is if we better understand these relationships, we can better support management and policy decision making in the future. So these questions include, how do people's values shape the way that communities manage and relate to the ocean? How do coastal communities adapt to social, political, or ecological change? Under what circumstances is it possible for different stakeholder groups to come together and make difficult decisions about ocean management. And finally, how do we build community resilience to risk? So I'll tease you with some of the findings from our 15 plus research studies over the last 10 years. This is by no means a comprehensive look, but I just want to give you some examples of some of the things we're finding from our different types of research projects. So with the question, are people knowledgeable about the marine reserves? In our early surveys, we did um, during very early marine resource impl implementation. So this is just before or right when the harvest restrictions were starting to come on board at the sites. In our surveys of visitors, of coastal residents and of people who live in the Willamette Valley. In those surveys, we found that the general public had very little knowledge about Oregon's marine reserves. And we also saw that coastal residents were significantly more aware of the reserves than those residents who live in the Willamette Valley along the I-5 corridor. Now we've repeated these surveys more recently and we found that actually awareness of marine reserves is increasing. There has been, um, for certain groups, an actual increase in their awareness of marine reserves. Um, and then for some groups, we found that uh, we hadn't surveyed them before, but we found that their, their, uh, their knowledge and understanding of Oregon's marine reserves is, is fairly high. So we believe that our communications outreach work that ODFW and partners such as the Cape Perpetua Collaborative um, has helped raise awareness, and we believe that this will continue to increase over time if we continue our outreach and engagement. All right, so what do you think people think about the reserves? Well, we found that both coastal and valley residents here in Oregon feel somewhat positive about the existence of marine reserves. But we also see that there are differences between what coastal residents think about the marine reserves and what Willamette Valley residents think about the reserves. So here's an example um, the, the top graph when asked the question, um, are marine reserves beneficial? 85% of Willamette Valley residents said, yes, they believe marine reserves are beneficial. Contrast that with um, it, 72% of coastal residents said, yes, marine reserves are beneficial. So again, both majority believe they are beneficial, but there is some differences between those. The second graph below that, when asked, um, this has to do with there's differences between what um, coastal residents and valley residents think the impacts of marine reserves will be. So this highlights that example. When asked, um, would the would an impact on commercial fishing be a bad consequence of marine resource implementation? Only 19% of Valley residents said that yes, 
They thought commercial fishing would be a bad consequence. Contrast that to 40% of coastal residents thought that would be a bad consequence of marine reserves implementation. So again, we are seeing some differences between coastal residents and valley residents. We also see within coastal residents, there is a difference of what people think from those residents who live close to one of the marine reserve sites versus those re coastal residents who live further away from the marine reserve sites. So for example, if we relook at these graphs here on the left, up top here, of the coastal residents, 81% of the coastal residents who live close to a reserve said marine reserves are beneficial versus only 69% of coastal residents who live further away from the reserves. And again, down the graph below, again, we see a difference where 30% of coastal, re coastal residents who live close to a marine reserve site said commercial fishing would be a bad consequence of marine reserves their implementation contrasted to 43% of coastal residents who live further away from a site. So again, we see some nuanced differences. And then we've also seen very clearly that in the minds of fishers and other coastal residents, marine reserves are not divorced from other resource management decisions. So if people are concerned or unhappy with some of the other ocean management decisions going on, they are also tend to be more uh, uh, concerned about the marine reserves, right? There is a correlation. They, 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 marine reserves are part of, they're not a singular management decision. It's part of larger ocean management occurring in Oregon that they are concerned about. Uh, just again to highlight some results, so among coastal residents, attitudes about the reserves were more positive among those who were more knowledgeable about the marine reserves, have more trust in the Oregon Department of Fish and Wildlife as a managing agency, who have more pressing ecological concerns and consider themselves to be more politically liberal. So again, you know, this is just teasing out um, how different people think and feel about Oregon's marine reserves. We also find that many fishers are concerned about marine reserves. They have concerns about what the real motivations underlying implementation of these designation of these sites is, and they have concerns about what future management and conservation measures will affect their livelihoods. Again, they are not separating marine reserves from other ocean management uh, decisions being made. So here's an example um, from our data. So these are questions for, that were asked to fishermen. You know, they were asked, are marine reserves productive for resource management? Only 10% of fishermen said yes. Um, the second question illustrated here are, fishermen were asked, are marine reserves being implemented for political reasons? 40% said yes. So just some perspectives from fishermen on Oregon's marine reserves. All right, so what are the economic impacts on fishers and fishing communities? So some of our findings show it's complicated. There's no very simple answer to this question. So let's look at some of the findings. So we we created a model to estimate economic impacts from fishing restrictions. And from that model, we were able to estimate that the areas that constitute Oregon's marine reserve sites represent approximately 2.9 to 3.8% of the total economic con contribution of fisheries that occur in Oregon's state waters. And of the fisheries that occur both, both in Oregon state waters and further offshore in federal waters, so that's the fisheries that occur outside of three nautical miles, of the total economic contribution of both state and federal fisheries off of Oregon, the marine reserve site areas constitute about 1% of that economic contribution. 
So a fairly small portion of what fisheries contribute here in Oregon. And our interviews with fishermen corroborate that most of the fishers, though not all, are currently not experiencing significant economic impacts due to the reserves. But the reserves are creating uncertainty about, and fishermen are concerned about what future management or conservation measures will affect their livelihoods. And it's this uncertainty that's making it difficult for fishers to make decisions about their business and to make plans for their, the future of their business. All right, so what are some of the social impacts that we're seeing? Well, we've seen pretty clearly that although marine reserves didn't cause distrust, they seem to be acting as a flashpoint for conflict between different stakeholder groups here in Oregon. And here's an illustration of that. So we've seen in our survey data and in interviews that depending on what stakeholder group you're asking, there are different opinions on who people think should be called a legitimate stakeholder, who should have influence on ocean management and who is trusted to make decisions. So this graph here on the right has is from the perspective of coastal residents when asked who should have influence um, on ocean management and who do they trust to make decisions about the ocean and natural resources. So you'll see this is from coastal residents perspective um, in the left high quadrant in gray you know, an entity with high trust, but they, someone they don't think should have a lot of influence um, is the US Coast Guard. To the right of that, the block in orange, coastal residents thought it was very important. Um, they had trust and should have high level influence on ocean management and, and making decisions. They, they noted Oregon Department of Fish and Wildlife, Oregon Coast residents and university researchers. To contrast that with the quadrant just below it on that says build trust in that teal color, right? So a group that maybe needs to build some trust that they think should have high influence, coastal residents thought that commercial fishermen, tourists, recreational users, and local governments uh, fit into that quadrant. So this type of research is kind of provides us insights on where relationships need to be either sustained cultivated or repaired in order to make better informed ocean management decisions here in Oregon. All right, well, so hopefully I teased you with some of our human dimensions research and you're interested in finding more um, about the, that research, but now we're gonna dig into the Cape Perpetua Marine Reserve site specifically talk about what's unique about the site, and then we'll take a look at some underwater video footage from the reserve. Okay. So the marine reserve portion of the site, the area in red, is 14 square miles. And then there are two marine protected areas and another protected area that we call a seabird protected area that constitute another uh, 30, was it, I think 42 um, square, sorry, square miles of protection. So the, the Cape Perpetua site is located between Yahats and the southern end of the site extends to just north of uh, Florence. Um, the reserve itself um, stem, extends from Devil's Churn down to 10 Mile Creek. Um, and so if you're at the Cape Perpetua Visitor Center, you are looking out, if you look slightly south, you are looking out over the Marine Reserve at Cape Perpetua. Uh, so this is a seafloor habitat map. We're zoomed in on just the Marine Reserve portion of the site. And so you'll see that the majority of the Cape Perpetua site, the habitats are sand or this mixed gravel type of habitat. But then you will see on the outer edge here in real, the really dark gray color, we, there is this patchy 
small patches of rocky reef habitat. And there's only a few other patches just outside of the reserve. This is an isolated reef. There's no other rocky reef habitat anywhere nearby outside of what you're seeing right here. And because it's isolated and there's no other rocky reef habitat around, the, these reef structure, these patches of reef have um, some really, uh, a, a really diverse community of fish and invertebrates because there's no other habitat for them to be living on or around anywhere nearby. So for such a small rocky reef area, it's a very high diverse um, uh, with a lot of marine life on it. Um, the, there's also some pretty extensive rocky shoreline that has some incredibly diverse rocky intertidal communities um, associated with them. And the rocky intertidal communities are very unique here. They have very high numbers of mussels and barnacles. Um, and this has to do with the oceanographic conditions in this area where you get a lot of that upwelling that occurs where you get this nice nutrient rich water um, and the continental shelf off of Cape Perpetua extends way out and it's just that phys those physical conditions along with the upwelling make it really ideal for mussels and barnacles to uh, reproduce and grow. So you get these really large and high numbers of mussels and barnacles in these areas. Um, this area has also been regularly experiencing low oxygen events, also known as hypoxia. So that's when oxygen levels get very low. And what we see when those events happen are on the reef here, which we usually tend to see you know, lots and lots of fish on, right after a hypoxia event, we'll go down with the ROV and study these areas and we'll see the fish are gone. And we'll sometimes even see dead invertebrates laying on the ground, right? Especially invertebrates that can't escape, right? They're not mobile. But then we go back a few months later and the fish have returned. So where are they going? We still don't know where they're going, but at least we, we are, we've been studying this for over actually 20 years. So this research has been happening even before the site was designated as a marine reserve. So some really interesting research and some really interesting phenomena happening at the Cape Fel, I'm sorry, at the Cape Perpetua site. Um, so, in a, so this has been a real, hotbed for marine science for the, with the hypoxia research. Um, Oregon State University and UC Santa Cruz have been doing about 30 years of rocky intertidal research in this area. So we have a wealth of information and data at Cape Perpetua, especially compared to other marine reserve sites or other areas of Oregon's near shore ocean. Um, Oh, another thing that we found more recently from our research, when we recently crunched a bunch of our data, finally, we found that um, it, Cape Perpetua has the highest number of commonly observed species compared to any other of the five marine, re uh, the other, other four marine reserve sites. And it's the only marine reserve site where we are finding brown rockfish and boccaccio rockfish. So these two rockfish species, tend to be less common, are not frequently seen in Oregon, but we do see them at Cape Perpetua. Um, we also see higher densities of canary rockfish, yellowtail rockfish, copper quillback, and yellow eye rockfish at Cape Perpetua compared to the other marine reserve sites. So again, some unique features here at Cape Perpetua. Okay, so let's look underwater at Cape Perpetua. So here's that rocky reef habitat that we're talking about. And then purple is that new to brink.
So here's some of that sandy bottom habitat that dominates a lot of the reserve. Um, but there's some really unique uh, transitional habitats between the sand and, and the rocky reef habitats. And that's where we often find some really neat diverse uh, communities of fish, so that transition between habitat, habitat types. So there's a sun star. So this video footage was taken before sea star wasting disease broke out at, uh, along the Oregon coast. All right, so hopefully you saw some pretty neat uh, critters there. Um, again, Cape Perpetua just an incredible diversity of marine life in the reserve. Um, that area was a very popular fishing spot for commercial crabbers prior to being protected. Um, we've been very grateful to have a lot of those fishermen help us with some of our research in the area. Um, but now I just wanted to share with you as we wrap up here where you can find more information about the Cape Perpetua site, about the research, about some of our findings, how to get involved, etc. So to let you know, our team recently released a marine resource program synthesis report. So this is reporting on the last 10 years of marine resource implementation. Um, so you can find a lot more about findings from our ecological monitoring and our human dimensions research. You can also see the types of outreach and community engagement that's been done by ODFW and our partners, such as the Cape Perpetual Collaborative. So if you're interested in digging more into that, uh, the program, the site, this is a great place to start and it's available on our website. Here is our website, it's OregonMarineReserves.com. Um, if you go to the resource library, you can find lots of different reports, you can find infographics, you can find um, outreach materials. So that's a great place to, to look. Also on our website, there's a tab called Reserves, called Reserves News. This is where we post um, our latest happenings and findings. So they're just short little stories to keep tabs on what's happening at the Marine Reserve sites. You can also sign up for our monthly newsletter. Um, every month we share some photos and videos and a short blurb on what we've been up to and if we've got any new reports out or any upcoming events. We also have a Flickr site that's got um, over 1,700 photos and videos. You're welcome to steal any of them and use them for any purpose, but there's some pretty cool um, shots from research and underwater. We also have a YouTube channel, so you're welcome to check out more videos on the YouTube channel. So with that, I will hand it over, Tara, to you for any questions that popped up, and yeah. Thank you so much, Kristen. I really appreciate having you here and hosting you today. Um, and it's so great to see those initial findings. I, I can only imagine what a lift that is to implement such a program um, and how exciting kind of getting those initial findings must be for you and your team too, but to continue watching. Um, so we did have some questions roll in, but I always like to kick off this session with one of my own. Um, I'm always curious to know kind of what was your inspiration or aha moment? What made you wanna study uh, a little bit further and go a little deeper into marine science? Mm. So, I, I grew up about 20 minutes from the ocean um, in, in Southern California and my family, we spent a lot of time at the beach and my dad was very into, into the ocean and oceanography and science. Like just 
out of interest, like that's not his professional background, but we would always go exploring tide pools. Anytime we go to the beach, my dad and I would, you know, be down for hours digging, <laughs> exploring the tide pools. Um, and so when it time came time for college, I was like, I'm going to give this marine biology thing a shot. And I really enjoyed my marine biology courses and really enjoyed that. But after college, I was like, I'm not a, I'm not a researcher. Mm-hmm. Like I love when I read a scientific paper, I go, I read the abstract and then I immediately go to the results and conclusions. <laughs> I want to know what did they find? <laughs> yeah. And I realized I did that because I wanted to apply that knowledge to help solve problems mm-hmm. or learn about issues and how we might address issues. And so that was kind of an aha moment for me. And that's when for graduate school, I decided to focus more on ocean policy and management and bring science Mm -hmm. to help address issues that we are facing. And um, I also always wanted to live at the beach. So. <laughs> yeah, always a bonus. <laughs> and for jeans to work most days. Not- <laughs> nice. <laughs> All right, so I'm just going to dive into the questions here. Um, what causes hypoxia? Mm. So hypoxia can be caused by different different um, phenomena, but here what we are seeing off the Oregon coast is we are getting, so what causes upwelling again is that in the summer, that Northwest wind, it blows the surface water offshore and then that bottom nutrient rich water comes to the surface. Well, with a changing climate, the winds are getting stronger and blowing more frequently without relax without relaxation periods. And so we're getting, an, in essence, we're getting too much upwelling. We're getting too much of a good thing. And so when you get that nutrient rich water come up, it causes um, an algal bloom, which is usually a good thing, right? That's a food source for fish and invertebrates to feed on. And then those fish and invertebrates do a lot of pooping and (laughs) shedding and right. And so that, that phenomena is actually taking oxygen out of the water So when you have too much of that upwelling, too much of that productivity without these periods of relaxation, like we're not getting a break from the wind and we're not getting a break from the algal bloom, it ends up depleting the oxygen too much. So so that's, um, at least that is the the best working knowledge that um, the oceanographers have of what is happening right now. And again, with the changing climate, we're getting more stronger um, sustained mm-hmm. northwest winds in the summertime. Mm-hmm. It's a great way to describe it all. Um, will you be able to, or do you know, or can share the value of how marine reserves, marine protected areas, and the seabird protected area do in protecting the prey base um, mm-hmm. for the uplisted marbled murrelet? That is a great question. So. Our research has really been focused on the marine reserve portions of each of the sites for our ecological monitoring purposes, um, because we are trying to understand how no har- no harvest um, affects marine communities. And we also want to have a better understanding how what fished communities um, and fished environments look like. And to do that, we need to, to flesh out any other factors, we need a complete no harvest area to to do that study properly. So we have not done any research into the seabird protection area and the species that it is being protected. So that is a research gap that is currently available for people, (laughs) um, for collaborators to take on. And we would be more than happy to collaborate with folks on that, but we have not currently addressed that. So that is my sad, disappointing answer. (laughs) Yeah, you probably noticed even more of those as you were culminating over the last 10 years, I would imagine, to some of those gaps. Um, Do you know, how do microplastics get to the areas where the rockfish would ingest them? 
I do not know. That is an excellent question, a very excellent question. And I don't know if Susan Brander or some of the other, you know, there are several other um, professors really studying that. Um, and I don't know if they've looked at any oceanographic models to help them understand that, but that's a net. Let's add that to the research question list. <laughs> yeah. Do you work with divers to build awareness and engagement among the diving community? That is a great question. And we should do, I would say we've done a very limited. Um, so most of our divers, um, they're all scientific certified divers, but they are almost all of them are volunteers or their um, staff at the Oregon Coast Aquarium. And um, through, through them, we have done presentations to Eugene Skin Divers. One of our volunteer divers um, heads that group. And she recently, um, her name is Diana Hollingshead. She recently is, um, started the Reef Check program here in Oregon. So that's where um, you don't need to be a scientific trained diver, but you do need to have a certain level of scuba dive certifications. They are doing additional scuba monitoring at the marine reserve sites. Um, Cape Perpetua is too deep to dive, but at the other mm. site. Um, so Diana is going to be a great resource and I think will be a great way for us to better connect with the larger diving community and do that outreach and engagement. And we actually have a story about Diana on our reserves news from a past, I think it was about a year ago. So check out Diana's story. It's pretty awesome. She's awesome. Yeah. And can you share any from your research on how the sea star population is currently doing? So in the rocky intertidal, okra sea stars, I don't, I don't think I have a picture of the okra sea star. Um, okra sea stars, which are one of the most prevalent sea stars you would see in the rocky intertidal area, they have rebounded quite well here in Oregon. Um, we've been seeing no, we've been seeing very little signs of adults exhibiting the disease, and we've been seeing lots of what we call recruitment. So we're seeing lots of babies in the intertidal. So we're feeling in the rocky intertidal here in Oregon, we're feeling good about okra sea star recovery. Um, subtitally, again, we're seeing it's different species are showing mm -hmm. different results. Okra sea stars seem to be doing well. Again, sunflower stars have been completely absent from any survey we've done um, since 2014. Um, and certain other species um, have been doing well and others not. In our in that synthesis report, we have a little bit more information on sea stars, so check that out. Very cool. Um, we have another question here, great info. Um, they had recently read that we had an excellent commercial Dungeness crab season. And so they're wondering, does this suggest that the marine reserves help commercial fishers and not harm them? That's a great question. So, so from some of our human dimensions research, other looking at, you know, fisheries, landings, values, we have not seen any big changes affecting landings or commercial dollars. I mean, fisheries in general are very cyclical, right? They are <laughs> very mm -hmm. different year to year. And so, yeah. Um, but we are pretty confident that marine resources have had minimal impact to the fisheries as a whole or, or the, you know, um, fishing ports as a whole. Some ports and some fisheries are more vulnerable than others and have been had some impacts versus others. Commercial Dungeons crab fishery overall has not been impacted by the marine reserve sites. Here. So we have a question here. Will we be bringing sea otters back to our waters? Do you partner with the Alaka Alliance around and, and share different research or is that kind of in Alaka uh, territory still at this time, kind of in the it's initial like, phases yeah, so, of that research? <laughs> so, OPW, um, other folks, our shellfish program and our marine mammal program have been involved with both the Alaka Alliance and U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service. And we um, are, you know, willing and available to provide information and data for those assessments that are currently going on and, and are pretty sure we will be providing some data to help support that. That'll be exciting to watch play out to how that goes. 
Well, that wraps our questions for the day. Just want to mention here, we also get comments, fantastic presentation, excited to learn more and just thanks. Um, and I just want to thank you again, Kristen, for being here on this Saturday morning. Really appreciated this. Loving seeing some new info come out. That's always really exciting. Um, but yeah, I highly encourage the audience uh, to go visit OregonMarineReserves.com to learn more. Uh, they do have amazing resources on their site uh, where you can dig in a bit deeper. So highly encourage you to do that. And with that, I hope you all have a wonderful weekend. Speaking of wind, we have it today here on the coast. <laughs> so don't get blown away. Have a wonderful weekend. Um, and we will pick this series up again next season. Thanks, Tara. Have a good one. Bye-bye.